Hello, this is Dancing Burr, the mad scientist of creative writing, the voice of the voiceless, the president-elect or previous president-elect at Myerskoff College, Lancashire's favourite son. And I'm just Tom, the other guy, <laughs> Koala. <laughs> A name that I am now unfortunately stuck with. Well, I happen to have some news that I was waiting until we, re- we was recording that Koala doesn't know. He knew that I was at my friend's last night, but what he didn't know is I have seen the Joker. And what do you think of it? Bloody brilliant. It is, isn't Absol- it? Good quality. I, I, I'm not going to say anything because of spoilers, and I, I don't want to do that to people. Do you get what I mean about yeah. that beginning bit? Yeah. I, I was actually saying to my mate as well, and I've got, to, I've got to be very mindful to keep this very spoiler free, is... I know what Koala is referring to in a previous podcast because you end up feeling sorry for the guy. But all I'll say to Tom, and I don't think this is giving anything away, it was quite brilliantly, uncomfortably on the nose for me, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm not going to even discuss the themes explored in the film, but all I'm going to say to Koala, I grew up in Kerr. Can you understand what I'm saying with that? I don't want to say too much. And do you get why it's... Still multiple choice. Yeah, When absolutely. they look at the paperwork... Yeah. And, and it's the possible where... he is or he isn't. Yeah, all I'm going to say But let is... me ask you a question. Did you debate with your friend? Did he or didn't he kill a certain character? I don't think he did. I don't think he did. I know that's pop- not the most popular opinion, See, but... See, there is apparently a deleted scene which proves she's alive. But yeah. I don't care. Deleted scene yeah. means not in the movie, means not canon. So I like to leave it as a multiple And I'm game. not being funny with you. I'm not going to say what he's done again, spoiler free, but um, a certain member of the Wayne family is a bit of a dick in this film. Do you know what? When I first saw him, yeah, I instantly assumed, and I don't know why my brain went there, but I thought he was actually John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get what I mean, lad? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, is he? He's not alive. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you not put two and two together at the time, though? No, but do you get what I mean about Robert De Niro? It's a glorified cameo, really. Yeah, isn't it? of course it is. Yeah. But that first scene when I mentioned, like, that's bloody good acting. He's literally putting on a happy face. Yeah, it was unco- It was sad, and I'm sorry. You end up feeling sorry for the guy. You do. I mean, to say, I, I can understand. Why a lot of people might find this guy relatable because I don't think I'm giving too much away. If you no. feel I am, edit it out. But the guy is he, he gets bullied. Well, no, that's, horribly that's bullied. Not, I won't need to edit that out. Yeah. But or, or what I should say is I can, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just physical. I mean to say it's, I don't think that's mental. giving it away because they show a bit of that in the trailer. He gets mentally, he gets emotionally bullied by even family members. There, I say. It's... The bathtub scene, did you think she was going to get it? The moment she made that comment. I'm not giving anything away, but I genuinely did. I, I, I was, think, yeah. I thought I that think, was a snapping point. I think you could tell he was building up to it, yeah. if you know what I mean. But yeah, it was. it's one of them. Excuse me. Excuse me. But yeah, I, I really did enjoy it. Um, I like how Diz, uh, DC... You were about to say Disney... <laughs> Disney, I like how DC aren't trying, or I get the impression, they're not trying to compete with Marvel by doing the same thing anymore. Well, not, not looking at thing. you, Justice League, but yeah. This this movie, they basically gave it no budget and free reign to do whatever the hell the yeah. director wanted. Yeah. So, I think it's good, and I think they need to do more like this. Villain origin stories. Yeah. Because a lot of times in uh, movies and stuff, the villains already exist, or sometimes they're made by the heroes, but it's not always the way. Sometimes the villain has existed years before the hero. Absolutely, They just yeah. need to change. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, uh, I, no, I got offered to see it last night, and I thought, why not? You know what I mean? This is meant to be the f- film of the year, so, yeah. Yeah, so, well, I'm glad you thought it was a good movie. But Absolutely. Could you see, it's for me, The Joker is one of their movies... And this is the last I will say about it. It's the Castaway movie. I cannot see, or an I Am Legend, I couldn't put another actor in that role now. He... See, the Joker's one of them where I think a lot of actors can play it. And I think what's great about the Joker is no matter 
who's playing it they've they put always, their own spin on yeah, it yeah they've always had, added their own uniqueness to it like so. Whacking Phoenix has been the I'd say the the one you feel sorry for absolutely yeah the one that snaps I'll say absolutely um Mark Hamill is your childhood one and yeah. the voice that everyone knows wasn't the one played by Jared Leto? Jared, no, I don't think there was. <laughs> I don't think he's ever played the Joker. He's played a joke. <laughs> oh! oh. Um, who else? You've, Jack Nicholson's Joker is probably one of my favourite. Yeah. He's Heath the Ledger. comical one. Heath Ledger is the Joker that removed the fun. Everything yeah. he did wasn't funny or jokes. It was sinister. The yeah. jokes had real threat behind them. What's your personal, asking you as a, as a fan, what's your personal favourite take out of all the portrayals? The Caesar Romeo, is it not Caesar Romeo? What was it called? Him in the 60s who did it. Oh. Uh, what was he called? He he was a classic. Yeah. But honestly, my, my go-to joker is always Jack Nicholson. Or yeah. Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill. I had a feeling you were going to say Mark Hamill. Just judging by what mm. else you're interested in, because you, you you used to like the animate uh, the game uh, well, versions and the animated. Yeah, ones. well, the animated ones I grew up with. But mm. um, who else? Troy Baker's also played him, and also the guy that voices and I can't remember Joe something. He voiced Bender from Futurama. Yes, I remember and you were Finn, telling us. So I it's it's yeah. I can only ever hear Bender. Ah, like, I see. I see. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, any any particular news this week? <laughs> <laughs> what was that smirking head on? Yes, there was because just before I recorded, I showed you something. They on the fi- <laughs> on the s- <laughs> my dreams nearly came true on the set <laughs> of the Eternals, the next Marvel movie that's a bit like Guardians of the Galaxy. I know what the that intru- is, I? introduces like Thanos's brother and yeah. Uh, Hercules, a bisexual superhero, and yeah. things like that. Yeah. They found an unexploded World War Two bomb. We nearly got rid of Angelina Jolene. Nearly. 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 <laughs> oh, the odds of that happening, though. I'm afraid to be a Marvel film. And also, but the odds of finding an unexploded World War Two bomb these days, I mean... Yeah, it's, it's unheard of. I mean, you got to think... How long's it been now since uh, World War Two ended? Oh God, it, more than five years at least. <laughs> it's gotta be. It's gotta be around that mm. time, hasn't it? But uh... there is someone that listens, and I know you listen. One of one of like the American peoples, and they have been trying to get hold of me because apparently they want to fact check me on something we said a couple of weeks ago, oh. and you will never. Be able to do that oh. because if I find out, you want to put the phone down. <laughs> oh really? No, they don't have my number, but I'm <laughs> I'm sure they'll tell me eventually. But uh, I wonder. I was I was I was curious to know the pedanticness of. Uh... No, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Can we can we address a slight elephant in the room about one of our questions that we asked about favorite alien races? It's not. Go on then. Go on. I Wally think on. is not an alien. <laughs> Doesn't fit into the question. The little <laughs> robot that came from Earth is not in the categories of he came from space. But on that note, we've had we have had some suggestions. Yes, we have. And I, I've, um, I've, do you want me to load them up, or do you want? Well, so far, you? Go some good ones. Uh, I'll go through them. Once you say what we think about them, from what I remember, while you look. What do you want me to tell you? Like what? What I thought of the, uh, of the suggestions? Yeah, or the actual <laughs> creatures. I th- okay, okay. Okay, so uh, well, we've I, we've I, got so far. I'll load it up because I don't remember my memories. Well, the memory easiest one to remember it. of a favourite alien is Groot. Now, for a creature that yeah. can only say three words, I am Groot. I and am and Groot. As the, well, uh, the, as, yeah. Go on. As Rocket would say, as he was explaining to Star-Lord. He, never mind, go on. He's got a lot of emotion in the movies. Like they animate him perfectly. Yeah, I've got. A what what agree. Groot scene sticks out in your head besides "We Are Groot"? To me, and I know this is probably one of those is it the, the stereotypical one, the one where he dances. See, for me, it's it's when he gives but a his little facial expressions as well. Yeah, they so... they nail that. But for me, it's when he gives a little girl the flower. Yeah, in nowhere. Oh, and as well when when. <laughs> Rocky's trying to explain which button it is. Yeah. <laughs> Do that. I am Groot. Yeah, yes. I am Groot. Groot. Yeah. I am Groot. No! 
How could you? Oh, I love. I, I do love in the, in the first movie when all those people are running in, and you see. <laughs> Just how powerful Groot is when all them guys are, and he's, I am Groot, and it's like a vine straight through all yeah. of them. Did you like Big Groot a little? Groot? I know it's essentially the same. Big character. Groot, little Groot. <laughs> Welcome to our cafe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, Groot. I know they're essentially the same character, but I like Teenage Groot. You like Teenage, teenage Groot? Groot is good, but no, I Groot's a really interesting character. He can regenerate from just a sliver of wood. Yeah, I suppose he can. So, yeah, what is your take on the alien race is Groot? Interesting fact about Groot. I think... He was originally designed as a villain. Do you know what it reminds me of? Uh, believe it or not, it was a saying that Bruce Lee once said all them years ago, and I, I am going somewhere with this, I promise you, and he actually said something along the lines of, I can't quote it word for word, those who make you... Uh, make you more li- more limited allows you to be more creative or it was something al- along them lines and i think because of the essentially the fact that they gave a character or even a race a vocabulary of pretty much three words it allowed them to think outside the box yeah because they so, have to get you, his you know, facial expressions yeah, so and his movement on point so, but yeah. do you know what i love about the character group go on is that vin diesel thinks he pulled off his acting prowess amazingly <laughs> when really it was the animators yeah. that's not yeah, that's that you know. Take a leaf out of Keanu's book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just saying, for those who get oh. the get what I'm referencing there. But but yeah, uh, what other suggestions did we so have? So we've done Groot. We've so done Groot. but your thought on the alien race is of Groot. I'd I like... haven't given it that much thought to be honest with you. I well, think, it's think about creative. it. All through the movies, everyone's always confused by him, and that he's had a few comments, especially Collector. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Collector. Except for four. Yes, the Collector is a being, yeah. remember, who was born at the start of the universe, right. and he has never seen another like Groot. So just how alone is he? Hmm, good question. I want the movies to explore that a bit. Yeah, do you reckon he ever will, though? Mm. It depends. His Groot's backstory is one of them, it changes depending on what comic line yeah, you're reading. Yeah, I mean, to say, that's the only trouble with continuity, yeah. isn't it, in the, in the um, MCU. It's not... But it's it's always the same as his planet is known as Planet X, because, well, otherwise it'd just be I Am Groot, if yeah. they named it. Right. And he has no way of getting back there, because no one knows where it is. That's sad. So he's he's very much yeah lost. Do you reckon he'll... I mean, to say, if you don't mind me asking, I don't think this is spoilers, but in the comic books, did he ever find a way home? Or was there, like, a yes. story where Groot ever Yeah, yeah, they, like, they did. Let's explore a little bit of that, because I don't know anything about this. See, I don't remember too much of it. It's oh, been no. years. <laughs> but I know they, they... Guardians, like, they rock up, they save the world, they leave. Oh, wow. I think there's so, even storylines where he's in exile. Oh, wow. I need to get into my Guardians of the Galaxy Yeah, oh, comics. I forgot to bring it around for you. Never mind. I've, I've got, got the first about one. It. Um, so there's one suggestion, and we've talked about that a bit. Yeah. There's another suggestion from Babylon 5. My suggestion? You want to bring that up? Yeah. Oh, am I... I, I was going to leave out that it's your suggestion. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> well, we can't win our own stuff. No. But yeah, <laughs> it's... Um, sorry, dude. But yeah, no, it's... Um, there was a race who I like. I mean, we're just making suggestions anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's par- partially why I didn't comment on YouTube because it were mine. I was unsure of the rules. Um, but no, my suggestion would have been the Centauri from Babylon 5. And for those who don't know who they are, imagine uh, uh, people in the Georgian period in terms of dress sense and clothing. Um Imagine them being able to travel into outer space, an interstellar empire of people in the Georgian period, if that makes sense. And you've pretty much got the Centauri. I love the wardrobe, I love the, the certain characters, and there's a particular favourite character, in fact he's probably the most favourite character uh, for me on Babylon 5, he's called Londo Malare, who's a Centauri himself. And without giving up too much away, he is... I feel it was well written, and Tom's looking at it. Koala, mm. my colleague, is looking at it now. Oh, I recognise. But look at the her style as well as Tom's looking at the images. Like I just think it's inventive. I just love them. I can't. Yeah, they look like toilet brushes. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. The, the like, her especially style is him. intriguing. 
they did calm it down with the hairstyles after a season or two, though. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much that's my favourite character. Him, uh, he's looking at imagery, images. So of they Malari. they dress like that. Are they a very warlike race then? Uh, yeah, towards right. I can't say too much because I don't want to give the entire. No, but like the, just the, the species. Are they a warlike? Basically, what it is. With Every the... sci-fi franchise needs a warlike race. Right. I'm going to give you the beginning story of because there's a lot more to it. What Babylon Five is brilliant for is string continuity. It was. You got to think why I love Babylon Five so much, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here. Is it was definitely one of the first shows that explored string continuity. And for those who don't know what that what that is, it, it, it essentially more shows you see now. That's pretty much what they do. Is one episode follows the story to the next, to the next, to the next. In nineties television, that barely happened. You look at Star Trek, even. Each episode had its own story, yeah. so you could put them anywhere, uh, chronologically speaking. Babylon 5 didn't do that. They had arcs. Yeah. And in the beginning with the Centauri, you saw a man, an ambassador, who, you, you know, you got to think, this is, especially in the pilot episode, you didn't really know a lot about his race, obviously, the, the introducing the audience to it. And the impression you get, and it sort of confirms it, is the Centauri as a people, especially in the beginning, had a huge, used to have a huge empire, but the people and the ambassador, I liked how they both did it simultaneously, had seen better days. This was an empire that was old, that was... Archaic, archa old. Yeah. And like imperialist also, power. And other alien races were getting ahead of them technologically. So it was definitely a, a case of a, an alien race that had seen better days. And I liked how they did it because it intertwined with the ambassador who was getting old who was getting nostalgic, who was looking at the past and dreaming of his youth. It is fucking brilliant, sorry. It is fucking brilliant, mate. I just love the show. Okay, so there's there's two. Yeah. Number three. <laughs> now this is an alien close to my heart and I'm so Go glad on, someone yeah. recommended it. This is, this is, this is to a description from what it's in. It's almost like a cat. Go on. It's a cat-like animal. The perfect killing machine, you might say. It's alien. The xenomorph. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I, I I love... I mean, obviously, the first the first movie has aged quite well compared to the others because old CGI, but in the first movie, it's a man in a costume in the dark, so you don't... You see a claw, you see a face. They do it a lot of off-camera. Right, right, right. Sinister. Uh, the famous... Everyone knows Alien because of the chest burster or the, the mouth with the tongue. Up. It's, yeah. It's... it's, it's it's brilliant. Good idea. No good it's suggestion. It's creepy. Yeah. And the extended lore of the Xenomorphs that yeah. they they look how they look depending on yeah. what the face hugger attaches to. Yeah. So if they go on a dog, for example, you get alien... Was it free? Yeah. I'm not too sure, actually. Don't ask me. Uh, I'm not hugely into alien. I should be. All they know they are... Hurt, st stomach gets yes, and no yeah. one else knew that was going to happen in that scene. No, did they not? No. Really? Yes. John Hurt, right, so everyone in the scene, Sigourney Weaver, everyone, was yeah. told, right, in this scene, something's going to happen, but we're not going to tell you what, because we want your real reactions. Yeah. And John Hurt was the only one that knew, and they told him, and they're like, look, you've, we want you to actually pretend you're in an excruciating amount of pain. And he was like, all right, John Hurt being the legend he was. He was like, yeah, fair enough. So he sat at this table, and the scene happens, and... It, uh, I think they had to do a couple of takes because the first time it happened, there's is it a woman that plays a doctor or something? Is, there's there's a, a short blonde haired woman in it. Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen it for so well, long. She but... literally did a runner. She, <laughs> whoom, I'm out. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That yeah. is brilliant. I think he's going to look it up now. But, but wow. no, it is. Even if you watch the actual scene. Yeah. Now you can see that they have general horror in their face, yeah, and it is—they might have only actually done it in one take. Um, if anyone's interested, look it up. But yeah, that scene, that pivotal moment. Yeah. And since then, Alien has spawned franchises and books and games, and it's—it's yeah. it's such a good alien race because it's not—it's in, intelligent. Yeah, of course. But it don't want world domination. It just wants to kill, to hunt, to feed, and to just make little baby aliens inside John Hurt's stomach yes <laughs> or just anyone um, it's go on it's sinister 
because it's not sinister. It's not doing it out of maliciousness. It's not doing. It's not killing and hunting all this because it's. It's like oh, I'm gonna get you. It's just doing what it's designed to do. Yeah. And I love the backstory that they made eventually. That don't the, know the backstory. So the, that, so, right. Well. So there's the engineers yeah. from that Prometheus movie. Yeah. They, uh, everyone knows Predator and Alien are linked, but the Xenomorphs were created to fight the Predators. Right. And the Predators liked hunting them so much that they actually started capturing them. So are they legitimate spin-offs of each other? Because I originally thought Alien vs. Orig- Predator Orig- was just a, a crossover. Originally they weren't, yeah. but by the time of Predator 2, yeah. uh, they started to get together in the franchises and mingle them and uh, things like that. And Predators used to actually be this... I mean, they still are, but... A much more advanced civilization. They were rival to these engineers that made the human race. Right. And these, the alien, yeah, or the xenomorphs yeah. were weapons, biological yeah. weapons, and um, they deployed them against the predators who they love to hunt. Fair so enough. there are some planets yeah. in the aliens vs predator yeah. universe yeah. that are nothing but xenomorphs, where they send young predators down to earn your. Essentially, earn your name. Right. Another suggestion we received is... And Predator is a good one that I'll talk about in a bit. Absolutely. The Daleks. The Daleks. Bit of a... Well, I won't say obvious one, because I didn't think people would, and anyone wouldn't have uh, commented the Daleks. So... Yes, and I know who commented the Daleks. And I believe this particular friend of yours commented and said, The Daleks. Yeah. So what do you actually think of this race? Because you know what? They may be very dated, but in like David Tennant's time, they got a lot more... We saw the inside. Well, to be honest with you, how much do you want me to cover this, mate? You are asking the Daleks to a hardcore, lifelong Doctor Who fan. How long have you got? Tell it, asking me what I think about uh, the Daleks is like ask, asking Mr. Kipling, can he make a comment about cakes? Well, he can't, because he's long dead. <laughs> but anyway, and so no. will most people listening Good to suggestion. this. Good suggestion. Do you know, do you know you what? Go on about to cut a long lecture short. I know a lot of people perceive the Daleks as very one-dimensional, and to a certain degree... But I love... See, they're, they're in, they fall in this category that I like, because they're very similar to another sci-fi race from Mass Effect called the Geth. They are the product of a war. They were made yeah. biologically or synthetically, yeah. which they are, aren't they? They're mutants. Yeah. To fight a war, but what happens when the war's over? Where where does your warlike race go? Yeah, exactly. Well, obviously they turn on you, or they turn on both. Yeah, uh, but then again, I'm not being disrespectful because I've heard that argument so many times about the dog or the one dimensional. I'm not being disrespectful, though. If you're going to use that argument, couldn't you argue that the Borg are one-dimensional, no matter how powerful they are? No, they are... because the Borg have to be 3D because they travel around in a cube. <laughs> hey! ah! <laughs> but, but you no, know what I'm getting at, what, though. What I like about the Daleks, which has just popped in my head, or more like a question, if they're such a warlike race that believe they're superior to everything, why do they have emperors? Because that's superior to even them. Well, here's the thing. Bit of background story about the Daleks. Terry Nation admitted that when he wrote the Daleks, they were meant to be. This was a guy. I don't want to. I don't want to go too much into it for obvious reasons. But this was a guy who grew up during World War Two, and there were certain ideals that of the superior race that were, shall we say, strong within certain well, parts yeah, of the world. Well, yeah, if you look at the original design of the Daleks, yeah. they're clearly wearing the World War Two hat. And all I'm going to one. say is, for those Doctor Who fans who might not be a huge fan of classic Who, look up Genesis of the Daleks, and it explains the origins of the Daleks to a T. It is also Davros's debut story. So look it up. What is Davros? Do you want me to really go go no, in depth I, on this? I, 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 I just I, I, want to know we'll, what he is. He is. Um, he, he was essentially a humanoid person, like me or you. Do you know what I mean? He he, he was. He, he he he's people have thought he was half Dalek, half man, and there was so many weird ass theories. No, all he was that basically. Right, I'm going to have to explain the Daleks' origins to a certain degree. There was a thousand-year nuclear war on Scaro. That left just two citadels 
uh, and they were still fighting each other. And during this war, um, a soldier called Davros got crippled. So they put him on this life support system. They kept him alive because there was a war of his scientific sound mind. But he went slightly mad. He was angry. So he genetically altered his own people to create the Daleks. He was capturing his own people and to create the master race that shall rise from the ashes of this nuclear war. So he war. created them. He created the Daleks, yeah. Interesting. See, I'll I'm, lend it to you. I knew he had something to do with it, yeah. but I was just never it's sure. Written, his... And you can tell throughout Genesis of the Daleks, it was written by Terry Nation again. There, there are very... How can I word this right? Um, n- nods to a certain other side in world war Two. that's all i'm saying you're allowed to say the word nazis yeah it i don't happens, i don't like it it happens though. in our history <laughs> yeah. and he, he he obviously terry nation always said as a, a a good writer always writes the when he's writing about you know enemies for his heroes to fight he always writes about those closest to home so those you know obviously racial hatred was a big thing in world war Two. so he was aware of it and obviously embodied that into these beings called the Daleks for that the hero are to fight. Nothing but hate. There are nothing but hatred. The Daleks. They're, yeah. Yeah, and it's incredibly so full of hate when they yeah. latch onto the head of human. And the they're also very York. contradictive. The Daleks, if you haven't guessed, because I don't know if anyone's noticed this. Even in classic Who, I mean to say, it, it, it might have been a pure accident. If it is, it's even more brilliant when you think about it. The Daleks. Consider, always consider themselves the more superior being. That is an established fact in Doctor mm. Who lore. Have you noticed how many times they've needed someone else's help, though, to make their plan work? Like, well, even in the one you mentioned in New York, they relied on everyone else to do the work for yeah, them, to do their bidding but for them. at the same point, you take a Dalek out of the suit. Yeah. It's just an octopus. Yeah. It explores that in Genesis of the Daleks as well, though, because the... What you're seeing, essentially, is the genetic mutated remains of a humanoid. And all they're keeping is the brain. And, yeah. Yeah. Look, obviously, for those who were Doctor Who fans, look up Genesis of the Daleks. It, it, you got to think as well, it's very 70s. I would be lying if, he, if I'd say, saying it wasn't dated. Which uh, Doctor was it? Tom Baker, of course. Oh, of course. Sir Jane Smith. Doctor Who at its finest. Is K9 in it? K9's not in it. This was just oh, before shit, K9's. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I have got K9's book, and the person who voiced K9 sent me a personalised note. I'll show it to you nice. after this podcast. But anyway, right. the Daleks. Anyway, yeah. so that's the Daleks. Talk about that Next one, we might as well talk about this one because it was in the comment. The Hive from Destiny. Now, I ain't got a clue. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have so, to do the explaining on this one. Who can I say the Hive are very similar to? Sounds Dar- very Wraith from Stargate. If you know who they are, I could be wrong. Do you know what I think they're very more akin to? Go on. More akin to the Borg. Actually, yeah, Hive, Hive Mind. I don't know who they are, so well, I, I'm not... They're a not a Hive Mind. Basically, they're an alien race that want nothing but death and destruction. They, The the leaders of the armies are these big, powerful, almost godlike beings. Yeah. Like, you saw that clip where... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, But the lower ones, you've got... Uh, thralls, and if they live long enough, they turn into what is essentially uh, a bigger humanoid, but they've got guns. They're insect-like, so they've got exoskeletons, which is hard, like as hard as steel. They're hard to kill. Ah. They don't need air for long periods. Basically, what imagine an insect, but it's got two legs. And then as they get older, they change forms. But right. the thing with the hive is they were originally almost a peaceful race. Ooh. They were basically betrayed by their lead or one of their leaders, Oryx, and these things called the Worm Gods, which live deep down in a planet uh, where their, their basic backstory is three beings, three sisters, uh, were worried about the race after their planet exploded and they landed somewhere else. And right. they were in an eternal war with another race. They went down and found old gods trapped there. Right. And. They were told, turn back. If you go any further, the darkness will consume you. They went, nah, it's all right, mate. They went down. They accepted this, essentially, dark gifts. And from then on, their race have um, parasites in them. Yeah. And they must basically fulfill a bloodlust quota. Wow. If for its 
If as long as they're killing, they're fine. If they don't inflict harm or kill, this parasite will eat them from the inside out. The hell. But they can channel it so the lower on the army, if they kill two people, yeah. one of that bloodlust or death, if you would, travels to the top. Oh, so the leaders hell. always stay alive. Ah. And if they live long enough and get enough kills, they will go to the next stage of their evolution. Ah, I see. But wherever the hive are, they corrupt. And what's his destiny? Yes, destiny. Yes, I think the comment said it was in destiny. So, yeah, wherever they are, they will corrupt and things will grow and it will just seem very unnatural, the world. Yeah. Almost like barnacles. Ah, I And see. they thrive in the dark and in destiny you are the light. So yeah. you're polar opposites to each other. Interesting. Strokes imaginary beard while he's thinking hard about this particular race. You you should look it up. You might I, need, like I know the, I should the do, backstory I? of the hype. Yeah, no, I wasn't but being yes. pedantic, but no, it was. Yeah, it's definitely someone they, I should they look are very into. S- the Borg want to consume yeah. and. Interesting thing. I don't. I don't mean to just dismiss the the hive, but it sounds like the origin story's already been established. Interesting thing about that though. No one actually knows where the boy came from. Uh, see, that was the next one. The Borg. <laughs> Who suggested the Borg? It was actually my brother. Oh. Hmm. So, okay. So. The Borg. Do you want to cover this or shall I? You're rubbing your hands with an excited look. Go on then. Right. The, no one actually knows where the Borg originated from. What I we think do they came know, from Star Trek. Do you reckon? Yeah. Gee, do you reckon? You they, don't say. They came from Next the Generation, Delta, didn't they? They they appeared originally in the Next Generation. Yes, they, they they made their debut, I think is the correct terminology, in an episode called Q Who. Now, people confuse that with Best of Both Worlds, but that was their second appearance. Um... These the thing. No one originally knows where the Borg came from. What we do know is that they came from the Delta Quadrant, the far distant part of the galaxy. Or we don't even know what they originally looked like because they the, assimilate. But there is a theory. Have you seen the very first Star Trek film called Star Trek The Motion Picture? Yes. Do you know the Vija and the big space probe and it was meant to be this metallic thing and it turned out it was being sort of controlled by the Voyager space probe? Yeah. Do you remember when Spock sort of did his own little my mail thing, which I thought was pretty stupid plot wise, but he sent it on its way. Mm. The theory is this was the origin story of the Borg, because this probe crashed into an underdeveloped planet, and the assimilation began. Now, personally, and now as I present to you that theory, bearing in mind I don't personally believe in that theory, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. I think the Borg. Their origin should never be explored. I like the Ooh, mystery. Yeah, I do. I do. But everyone thought that about the Daleks, to be fair. And Genesis of the Daleks is considered... It actually says on the case as well, considered to be the number one Doctor Who story. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what. I will backtrack that statement then. I will accept an origin story of the Daleks as yeah. long as it's ripped by the original creator. That and it was? Made. Yeah. Uh, or I will accept... Mm. Uh, origin story from the Borg if it's made by the original creator of the Borg who came up with the idea because it's only in that person's head where you get that proper origin story and another interesting thing about the Borg that not many people know is that on paper there was without going too much into it the idea of the Borg essentially was going to be believe it or not the Ferengi they was going to be the th- the big main threat the Murray Sue threat as it were but when they realised by the end of season one, season two, that the Ferengi wasn't that overwhelming, uh, like dominating, because if you ever watch an episode called The Neutral Zone in Star yeah. Trek, where it's it's also the episode, it's a weird episode because two plots are going on simultaneously, which was weird for Star Trek at the time, because you had three people that was in cryogenic stasis and they was in the neutral zone, and the Romulans, and they realised someone was attacking the Romulan bases. That was the Borg. That attacked those bases, but they never actually confirm it because the Romulans assumed it was the Federation. Ah, but you so see, they didn't really build on here's, that. Here's more than just all the fluff. The Borg. <laughs> How do you actually feel about them as race? Because when I was a kid, they yeah. terrified me. They terrified this, me. This is like move over Skynet. This is yeah. essentially <laughs> well. You've only got a certain amount of time to kill them before they learn what you're doing and adapt their exactly. shields and their weapons. And... and did you know originally there was going to be an insect race? That that actually makes sense. There was actually going to be an but insect race. That, I think they're more terrifying. Like You yeah. can kill as many of them as you want. They will just 
start changing and adapt to your weapons with their own shields. They will adapt their weapons to kill you quicker. Absolutely. And then... Do these specimens that become Borg have to be alive, or can they do it on dead subjects? I think... Actually, good question, that. That is a good question. You get the impression that they're victims, who they, they assimilate. Mm. I mean, they are... Who the Borg picked to assimilate. They are victims. They are victims. No one goes, you know what, I want to be a Borg. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, to say Seven of Nine in Voyager was always willing to go, I want to go back to the collective. How many times did we see that episode? Oh, God. Do you know what I mean? I'm not being disrespectful to Voyager, but no, on a serious note, um, I think the victims, it, it, you get the impression they have to be alive. They can't just assimilate a corpse. Yeah. That's what they ask you. That's a horrifying thought as well. When you're a Borg, you're aware. Seven well, of Nine John went Luke into it, and aware. John John Luke, but Cutus of Borg, yeah. Lacutus so, of Borg. so what's your take on him? I've just given, I've just probably bored our listeners with a boring ass lecture about the Borg. What is your take on the Borg? Uh, Borg essentially, the Borg. Mm. Well, like again with the Hive, because the Hive can do that. Yeah, uh, they are the dominant. That they're, they're they're a threat. Like the Hive yeah. can take. Yeah other entities and they become twisted versions yeah. of what they were yeah. and controlled and the Borg is very similar yeah. but every every time you see the Borg get killed in Star Trek mm. in the back of my mind it's always like yay the heroes won but in the back yeah. of my mind it's like this is a small victory because you don't know how many there are well you don't know where it comes the, from your entire fleet just struggled against one cube Let's get comfy. <laughs> there was, it, I tell you what's interesting to see as well was the speculation. And in a way, I'm gutted. Not many uh, Trek fans don't do it anymore. And it's not their fault. It's because a lot of the questions have already been answered. And the speculation was, before Voyager sort of exposed, there was, there was like this big citadel of the Borg, wasn't there? You ever yeah. seen that? And there With was that harness in the power everywhere. from the... Sort of very yeah. clever ideas going on there. But the original theory was that there was only so many... There was The theory stated that people believed there was only half a dozen board cubes throughout the galaxy and it was just them until Voyager sort of shitted on that theory. <laughs> but yeah. But no, it's a shame really because it's interesting though to see the speculation because... But even to this day, no one knows... Where the boy come from? Who are they? We know the cybernetic. We but know... we know they're organic. Yeah. I want to know, did it start with a life form? Yeah. Or did it start... Is it a computer virus that got yeah. sentient like a Skynet? Yeah. Sort of thing. And what's... And I, I can't take credit for this. What someone else has stated is that what is surprising about the Borg is that their ideals are quite... They are the yin... Um, y, I, from an ideological perspective... They are the yin and yang to the Federation mm. because the Federation, in their own way, they inc- they try to include all societies to become a fem- if they want to become a member of a Federation. Yeah. In a similar way, the Borg do that. They but assimilate you lose all, identity, but they force but, it. So, but they keep the Borg also keep the intelligence and learn. So yeah. In a way, yeah. But next, sorry, yeah, next I could talk alien, about this all yeah. day. Go on. What are we missing now? How do you mean? Oh. What was I going to say? He's clicking his fingers. I am clicking my fingers. <laughs> Mass Effect. Just. Oh, yes. you do. Because you don't know too much about this. I want to get into Mass Effect, yes. Uh, I would recommend it. The books are brilliant as well. Right. Um, But, yeah, Mass Effect, there are some brilliant alien races in that. But Mass Effect is like, imagine if the, uh, my favourite race is a race called the Drell. Right. Yes, you were speaking to... And the Drell are basically what humans could have been. That planet is ruined by toxic waste and, like, just pollution. And they started dying. And it's... They were... They're like lizard, almost, creatures. Reptilian. Right. Um, They look human, though. But they've got flat faces. Ah. And they were saved by a race called the Hanar, which are like floating jellyfish. But the problem with the Hanar is even though they're an advanced space or race... Yeah. Their planet being like a jellyfish like creature, even though they can float, and they're psychic, their water that planet is mostly water. Wow. So the Drell, even though they Ugh. they became almost servants, they, they're very uh, religious as a people. Right. And they accept their mistake. But there aren't too many of them left. Right. But even though they love those that save them, yeah. 
the drell can only live about 40 years because of being reptilian. All the moisture in the air kills them. Right. So that that they don't want to leave those that save them. Yeah. And they would never say anything, but at the same point, it, it kills them. Bloody hell. They they can explore the galaxy. It, it sounds like you made it. I'm not gonna lie to you. When when on that but phone, go on, go on. The Sorry, character you, that you meet, he's like the universe's best assassin, and he was trained by them. But he's religious, so after every kill, yeah, he will pray. And through the game, um, you get him to join your crew, and it's all about redemption, and you yeah. can talk to him about his religion and things like that. But there's a poignant moment which a lot of um, Drell have. Uh, the fear, the opinion of is even though a lot of them are like assassins or mercenaries and things like that for the Hanna and their yeah. military force, they don't see themselves as doing any wrong because you don't get mad at the gun, it's whoever's pulling the trigger. Interesting. Don't get mad at the assassin who get mad at who paid the assassin. Yeah. So it, they're, they're a very interesting race, and I would recommend people look at There are like hundreds. Well, not hundreds. There's a, a good 30 races in Mass Effect that are very interesting. Yeah. But h- humans in the Mass Effect world, imagine Star Trek, but the f- humans have only just appeared and the Federation was already established. Wow, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So, yeah. there's, there's a Mass Effect one. Ooh. I've got to be honest with you. As I, as I was going to say, uh, and the phone call, was it last night, the night before? Yeah, we were it was talking in them. depth. Um, you sound it way more interesting, so I want to get into it a lot more now yeah. since our last well, conversation it's, about it. It is. It, Mass Effect is the gaming world's version of Star Trek. The story is amazing, the sci fi is amazing, the lore is amazing, and it's, they're just good games. And they, yeah. your choices build up to poignant moments. Right. I'm choice in you. number one could affect number three, things like that. Right. No ways, no ways. On to my next one. Now, this is one that I really love Go on. The Elite from Halo. Now, you don't yes, know too much about Halo. No. Let you fill in the gaps In Halo, on this one. you have the Covenant, and they're at war with the humans, and the Covenant are just a collection of alien races. Right. And their main military force are the Elites. Right. And the Elites are seven foot tall. Yeah. Do you know what they look like? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with yeah. the starfish yeah. mouths. But they are a very warlike race, but they're also, they're essentially space go on, go like on, go on. samurais. Yeah. So they have a strict code. So yeah. they won't kill like unarmed women and children, or at least they shouldn't until the law yeah. said that they should. Ah, they're, they're, there's discrepancies. Fair enough. And uh, in later games, they actually break away from the covenant because they realise what they're doing is wrong, and their whole religion is based on a lie to do with the Halo rings. Yeah, because they're taught that it's like um, the great journey. They these races collectively yeah. need to find these and turns out the Halo rings are just big weapons right. that wipe out all life. Interesting. To stop a, a, essentially the Borg. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, elites, I love them. They've got amazing culture. They're stronger than humans, faster than humans, but if a human beats them in a fight, they respect that human. Yeah. Oh, wow. And they will sometimes let people live and they have... That culture was suppressed by the Covenant. Right. Like, things that used to be titles of great honour, like yeah. Arbiter, you are now uh, marks of you are now the Arbiter, you will do missions until you die, whereas it used to be a leader. Bloody hell. Like so there's there's a lot to look in. Halo's lore is amazing. It spans, I think, there's actually like 200 years of lore. Wow. And all the alien races of things like that. Yeah. Like loads of law, and there's all the um, what was done to the Spartans and the genetic changing and cyborgs and all that. It's it's it is an yeah. amazing franchise <laughs> with really deep lore, books, comics, you know, and games, games, obviously games that were actually you know released finished, unlike <laughs> some games <laughs> like Destiny. Like, <laughs> Oh, oh, so tell me, explore more into Destiny. Like, what was going on? Why didn't didn't they finish it? What do you think about Destiny, actually? I actually thought the first Destiny was really good, and the right. second one I played for quite a bit. Right. I just didn't like the whole... You had to keep buying the expansions. Yeah. Like, otherwise you didn't get the game. Yeah. It was just... And most gamers, a lot of gamers have turned around, and a lot of the game industry has turned around and said, 
We are sick of, they call it games as a service. Yeah. You buy the game and then you've got to wait three years to see if it becomes good. Right. Whereas I just want my game that gets released finished. I don't want to have to... I mean, yeah, it's common. You buy a game now for like 60 quid. Yeah. And then you get the expansion for like 40. Right, right. But Destiny right. has four or five expansions. Ah. And you're, if you were playing it with your mates and you play Destiny, you are sort of stuck. It's like, oh, I'll just get this one. No, well, we've got the other two. All right, I'll play with you. No, nope, you're behind a paywall now. And what makes matters worse is they've released the first De- uh, Destiny 2 with the first year of like expansions yeah. as a free-to-play game now, yeah. which means all those people that have spent nearly £200... Yeah. That's redundant. Yeah. So there, and I'm one of them people. So do we have any more suggestions? Uh, there, there is a, a few, which I will have to look on the top of my head. There but was before, a really obscure anime one that I can't remember. Before you do that, I think we should just give... I'm not going to go too much into it because we've only got so much, so much time. But the ones that didn't get mentioned, I'll just mention what yeah, they are. Yeah, let's do it honourable mentions. Yeah, Klingons, Predator. Predator, Klingons from Star Trek. The Time Splitters, could they be considered one? Yes. The Wraith from Stargate Atlantis, and that's... Uh, Stargate SG-1. The Gould. The Gould? The Gould. Gould. The Gould. Gould? <laughs> the weird-ass ones that yeah. pose as Egyptian gods. So they're your honourable mentions. But... And, um... Yeah. Oh, God, that's going to be... Venom. Venom's a name. Venom. And Shadows from Babylon 5. That's all my No, I'm actually going to have to watch Babylon 5 because yeah. you're, you're obsessed with it. Oh, I'm, am I obsessed with yeah. it? So yeah, we we've now taken. I don't even know if we've done ten. What did we? Groot, Daleks, your cen- Centauri, Centauri, uh, the Hive, the Borg, the Borg, the Drell, the Drell. Uh, we've we've got more. Yeah. Basically, um, whoever we pick. I mean, we wanted ten, but we didn't get ten. Whoever, yeah. whoever we pick, we will find a way to message you or but reply the in a comment is, and send you a Steam key. That being said, we're, we're incredibly grateful for what suggestions we got. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So, yeah. Is there anything else at the top of your head you want to talk about? There is one thing. Do you, want, do you want us to do it? The Go on then. Song. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do that three song? Now... Basically, I've just I've just got an idea. We could make it into a, a tiny segment into our podcast. He's is... trying to expand my music horizon. Well, no, I, the idea essentially is that we both expand each other's horizons. So we go to music we'll, it, neither of us would necessarily go to. So I have my three suggestions. Do you have three suggestions? I do. My suggestions are, you ready? Don't have to write it down because you can just go back on the podcast and listen to it. Peter Gabriel, Salisbury Hill, if you haven't heard of that song before. Um, Clannard, that is spelled C-L-A-N-N-E-D. Now, I couldn't find the title of the song, but if you just type in YouTube Harry's Game, because the song was usually used, hugely used, in a a, a program uh, called Harry's Game in the early 90s. Lovely song. And Kate Bush, This Woman's Work. Those are my three suggestions for you. Am I allowed to suggest musical songs? It's for both of us, yeah. So, so you suggest these songs to me. Mine are just because I love the band and the singer has such a, a range. Yeah. yeah. Low, like, if you didn't see the music video to this or know who was singing, you would assume it's two people, a woman and a man. Wow. So one song is Beast in Black, yeah. Blind and Frozen. That sounds lovely. Go on. <laughs> um, another song is Do You Know Any Nightwish Stuff? Nightwish. Story time. Yeah. Nightwish is a, a symphonic metal band, so <clears throat> there's there's some keyboards and violins. Mm. And oh, story it sounds cool. Uh, with, uh, cool and they've got powerful women lead. Right. So there's two. Uh, third one, The Confrontation, but not the one you're thinking of, from Jekyll and Hyde, the musical. Wow. And The Confrontation... Careful which version. You need to listen to like a, a with lyric one and yeah. listen to the original man singing because it was one that David Hasselhoff did. Ah. Uh, which, to give him credit, when he does it on stage, Jackal and Hyde, he's yeah. got to keep switching between two people. But the original wow. guy that did it has yeah. a really nice voice and then a really dark, deep voice. I mean, it's so good. Um, so, what did you make of The Walking Dead's original comic compared to the show? I have read it. I have read it fully. Um, 
It was fun. I think that's the only word I can describe. I enjoyed it. I already knew the story. Mm. Um, I was... I already knew by the time I read the, the comic, but I, 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 I felt that, and I only say this because of the introduction of the character Daryl, I, th- I felt, because I've seen the episode before I read the comic, it is Daryl, isn't it? You gave me a funny look there. No, I'm not. Daryl's not in the comics. No, he's not in the comics, but he is in the show, yes. isn't he? And because I knew that he wasn't in the comics... Um, I just felt because I watched the episode prior. You want to see what happened it, when I'd, he's not there saving the people. Yeah, yeah. So it quite darker actually. I would say the comics are to be honest mm. with you. And did, still a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. And can I say this in the comics? He kills Shane a lot quicker in the comics. Yes, in, in the first that's, issue. He, that's yeah. That's a thing. Be- difference with comics and series. They do things in different orders. Yeah. Which yeah. means comic fans, you don't know who's safe. No, no. Same with Game of Thrones. They yeah. changed the yeah, order. Yeah, they or changed it they? round. Yeah. yeah, not dramatically as that, but no, yeah. that. Yeah, The Walking Dead. He changed the order a lot. Right. Same with American Gods. Right. And Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Neil Gaiman. Are you a fan one. of Neil? Gaiman? I I am. He wrote for an episode in Babylon Five. Just to put it out there. Yes, he also wrote Lucifer the show. I didn't know that. I didn't know. I know the show Lucifer. I, I, my mum's really into it, but I didn't know that he plays God. Does he? Yeah. In in oh, there's wow. there's a there's a what if episode and it's narrated by Neil Gaiman as God. Yeah. Oh wow! I knew he he wrote Bad Omens as well, didn't he? With Terry Pratchett. Right. Yeah, I knew that. So I did know. He that. likes he likes creative control in things. Yeah. but I don't think he's got too I think much. We've discussed in Neil Gaiman before, yeah, yeah, haven't we? we? Have. Because yeah, I he's love a good writer. As, and Coralie, as, yeah, because I'm as as a, yeah, that's his attempt at a children's book. For <laughs> fuck's sake, man! <laughs> yeah. No, I I do love that Neil Gaiman's. Uh, when he makes a world, yeah. a mundane world, but he somehow manages to put the magical, yeah, world exists underneath ours yeah. in a more realistic way. He also. For any Marvel comic fans out there that want a different... There's obviously loads of Marvel universes. Yeah. Neil Gaiman wrote a series of comics and kicked off a Marvel universe set in the 1600s. Oh, with wow. With all our modern day characters back then. And wow. it's 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 that that is that sounds pretty cool. I'm not yeah, gonna in lie Victorian to you. England. Oh wow. No, this not is... Victorian. Edwardian? Sixteen hundreds? Sixteen hundreds would be not Elizabethan. Yeah, it might be. But he set it in that time. Yeah. It's called Marvel sixteen oh two. Right. Can be hard to track down, but they are fantastic yeah. reads. If we get it wrong, I'm sure someone no, it, will. It's, correct it's definitely sixteen oh two. I've that... got it on my show. I know I'm just trying to work okay. out sixteen or two. Trying to work out if it was the Tudor, Elizabethan, it's all th- it's it's definitely a queen yeah. I see in it. But if I get it wrong though, I'm sure someone will yeah. know, correct us. But I mean the title of the comics, right? So people can always look it yeah, up. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, fantastic. There's loads of interesting Marvel yeah. worlds that you can pick up and read without knowing everything. <laughs> old yeah. Man Logan or the Old Man Universe is quite good. Oh, yes. I remember you were uh, you brung it up. But the Old um, Man Universe, it's very much Old West style, but it's it's modern day. It's 40 years after the villains won. Right. It's that sort of story. So all the Avengers are dead apart from a couple. Um, the main ones are Hawkeye, yeah. who's actually, after 40 years, thought, you know what? I'm starting to fight now. <laughs> Problem is, he's going blind. Really? So the master archer is going blind. Right. Logan, obviously he kicked it off, old man Logan. Yeah. Who, in the comics now, he may have met his end. Right. Oh dear. Um, and there's actually ones which are fairly new, mm. and it's old man Quill. Wow. Old man Peter Quill. So what is the state of... The universe, like, 40 years in the future after all the villains on Earth teamed together, did they go into space? Yeah. Did they also ruin the universe? I'd love to see... I've got to be honest, I don't know why. I, I, I just see the character, uh, Peter Quill, so relatable. Also, I wanted to go backtrack in the conversation a little bit. I don't know if you knew this. Neil Gaiman also wrote for an episode in Doctor Who as well. Do you know yes. what it is? He, um, it's one of the scarier ones, isn't it? It's the one where... It's a Matt Smith one, and he takes... Um, Oh, uh, it was it, Claw. The the kids Claw was babysitting to a planet, a theme park, and s- turned out Cybermen. I think was invading it. Yeah, it's the one where Warwick is it Warwick Davis? Yes, he's in it as well. But yeah, that's the episode Neil Gaiman wrote. 
But yeah, we are nearly at time, so let's start wrapping this up. Okay, you, is it your turn or mine? So Please like, comment, subscribe. Also, we are on and uh, follow the Twitter because we're yes. twits. <laughs> um, if I clap there, I'm sorry if that hurt yeah, you. Yeah, I did is. that a couple of times. If, if you are listening on Spotify, great. But if you, we are now on Apple Music, so if you're listening on Apple Music, please subscribe to that and um, maybe we're being recommended and we we start growing. And then, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but my plan for this podcast is world domination. <laughs> I, I would love that. Um, anyone that subscribes will be sca- like spared the initial purge. <laughs> um, we will use funds to build bunkers yeah. and, and any subscribers will be safe there. Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. Everyone else absolutely. will die horribly. <laughs> oh, no. But like I said, you know... Also, if you're part of the Jennifer Aniston fan club, please stay away. <laughs> <laughs> but any, like like we always say, you know, joking aside, if you know anyone who may uh, enjoy, enjoy listening to our podcast, this, yes. please share and, and don't be afraid to send a link. That's what we're all and about. And when we... Dis- we will randomly pick one of these comments for these alien races and we will sort our Steam key. Yes, and can I, can I bring it up? We're, we're looking into, not just yet, within the next couple of episodes, we'll let you know, hang, uh, giving out prizes, I believe. Yeah, that's what a stink is. So, Sorry. We're, we're, yeah. we're sick. I'm not, I'm not that intertwined. <laughs> but yes, so, but yes. If, you know, if you know someone who might enjoy something like that, please share. And the more you share, the bigger the prize, the bigger the prize, the more chance you have of winning. More that's stuff. true. So. I mean... Oh, in um, so yeah, I've been uh, Tom Koala, and I have been Dancing Burr. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Bye bye. See you next week. See you next week.